Okay. Uh, Barbara Magnuson? Yes. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. In what year? In 1934. Okay. Well, what was it like growing up in Little, uh, growing up in Little Rock? Well, it was a very um, peaceful place. Yeah. Um, I, my parents were not wealthy. They were both school teachers. Mm -hmm and they were paid very poorly in Arkansas, which is a southern state, and most of the southern states do, are not very wealthy and don't pay their educators very much. Um, but we were comfortable, and I had very good parents uh, who were uh, very, very loving parents and very, very hardworking. They both worked. And I had one sister, and um, it, the South and my hometown are places that I never want to go back to. I, um, and it wasn't that I personally had a lot of bad things happen, but as I grew up, um, I became aware, oh, probably in my early teens, of something going on which I thought to be wrong. and as most kids are, born of conscientious, you know, ordinary white parents, and you're taught to respect what they say, that they know the truth, and that all of the adults that are their friends and colleagues also do, the teachers, the preachers, and, um, you know, the mayor and whoever. And I began to realize that there was something wrong with our system of what I now see as fairly extreme segregation. It was like apartheid in, um, in uh, almost like in South Africa. And I don't know how I came to this realization because I looked up to my parents and I really took all this to heart. They were the authorities and they didn't make mistakes and life was, my parents liked to protect me from any bad news or any news that um, adults might have problems such as the husband of the church organist who was an alcoholic and used to stagger by our house and we, she, they couldn't keep us from looking out the window. <laughs> but, you know, they didn't like us to know these things. Life was supposed to, I couldn't even see, um, you know, ghost story movies. Um, and uh, some children's adventure stories are just a little bit too much for them. And I had to stop in the middle of a big adventure with a serial on the radio. So uh, anyway, they, I, it was in this atmosphere that I began to have doubts about what people were saying and doing because um, I don't know if you know what the practice of, of formal segregation was, if you've studied you know, the Civil Rights Movement and um, a woman named Rosa Parks who would, oh, when I heard about Rosa Parks and I thought back to my childhood about what it would have, have I, I mean, it was just unimaginable that a black person would refuse to go to the back of the bus. I mean, it was literally unthinkable. Uh, and when I heard that, I was in my 20s and I just, just gasped. I, I just couldn't imagine a woman having that kind of courage. Um, and of course it was a very, very important thing, but that was one of the things. In the stores, in the department stores, black people were allowed, but if they wanted to go to the bathroom or they wanted to have a drink, they went to their own bathroom or they drank out of their own uh, water fountain. And they were made out of porcelain, just like you would a lot of them are, are, but there was a white one for white people and a black one for black people. And I started asking questions and so forth. And my parents had been very respectful of black people. We, they employed um, people because my mother worked um, once a week and when we were small they were, you know, stayed with us. Uh, uh, and, uh, my first memory of a, of a nanny sort of person was a black lady and I was, we were warned you know, very sternly, we were to treat her with respect. And the word nigger was never allowed in our house. I don't think it was, I don't even know how I knew it because I, I don't think it was ever pronounced. So in a sense, they were more liberal, but they were terrified of intermarriage. But whatever, it resulted in uh, a, a very 
very unfair situation. And it was extremely um, influential in my life, be, not only you know, for the in thing itself, but it taught me the lesson that no matter whether every single person you know thinks something is right, it may not be. And you have to think, of, think for yourself. And um, that's what I've done whenever I, I've had a thing. So that, that was my formative years. Um, and um, I loved learning. Um, my, I don't even know whether my parents are just encouraged me or not. My father uh, would often get books sent to him by publishers to review for textbooks and things. And he'd bring them home. He, he also began to, it, movies and slides and, you know, PowerPoint, forget it, but, you know, <laughs> um, audio-visual type things were just beginning to be used. And certainly in, in the South was backward. It still is about 40 years behind the rest of the country. It still is. Um, and at least. And, uh, but he started this program, actually it was a career, it ended up being a career move for him. But he would bring home educational movies and slides and stuff to show us. So, you know, I just loved it. And uh, I always did well in school. And uh, when I uh, got to uh, high school, where my mother was a teacher, uh, I didn't ever have her in a class, thank goodness. But, um, you know, I had to start thinking about what I want to be and so forth. My, my first thought is I want to be a brain surgeon, but I was reading a little bit about it and I realized that you had to be ambidextrous, you had to be able to use both hands. And I'm not well coordinated in the first place, and certainly not using two hands, I thought that, scrub that. <laughs> so um, anyway, I loved science, I was cur I'm born asking questions, very, very curious person, still am. Um, as the people around here are well aware, the maintenance people now could, you know, explain to me the mechanics of what they're doing, because I'm curious. But um, I just like to know, you know, why things are the way they are and, and what makes things happen and so forth. And um, my science teaching wasn't very good in high school, but I had a, one of my best teachers as a physics teacher. And, and sort of became, and this was my senior year, and it became kind of clear to me that this is really basic science. It's getting down to the nitty gritty of what's, what makes things go and, and what is going on in the universe. So I decided that um, I would, I wanted to go to college, and I wanted to get out of Little Rock. North Little Rock is actually where I lived, so I was born in Little Rock. Um, I wanted to get out of there, and my parents didn't have a lot of money, but I managed to get a scholarship to a very good school that's not well known, but it's highly rated, and at least it is today, and that was Washington U in St. Louis. And uh, some of the presidential debates have been held there um, in the past few years. But, um, and they have a good physics department, and it turned out that the head of the university, who was called a chancellor or something, was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and a very, <laughs> very compelling man. I got to meet him, and he actually had some famous physicists visit the campus, and I got to meet some of them. Um, but in any case, I decided I wanted to do that, but I was, I was not clear um, whether that would really be a suitable profession for me, but I came in as a declared major for physics and was also interested in teaching and I ended up uh, taking a, a, a second major which was in, in education, going through, you know, practice teaching and stuff. But um, my life took a different direction and I, I, the university experience was absolutely wonderful and uh, among the things it did was get me out of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And um, when I graduated, I got a job in a very, very interesting place. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, controlled fusion uh, research, which is, there's news about it. Fusion is the process of fusing or sticking together two nuclei uh, if they want to be stuck together and they have to be heavier than iron. Uh, 
beyond uh, they produce energy. Uh, it's a form of nuclear energy um, which can be generated from uh, heavy hydrogen and found in seawater uh, and um, it doesn't result in a lot of uh, radioactive waste. It's an almost limitless source of energy and comparatively clean. And the kind of thing that's going on in the sun or in the hydrogen bomb. Uh, uranium, which produces the current uh, nuclear energy and electricity, is, uh, produces energy by fission. To fission is to split apart. And it, uh, believe me, I don't. Even, I can't even explain to you why the, you know the different heavy atoms and light atoms. Some produce energy by sticking together, others by splitting apart, but they do. And the hydrogen bomb uses this reaction of, fu of fusion, and so does the sun and all of the stars that you see in the sky. Um, so, because um, the fuel is hydrogen and helium. Uh, up to a point, and they get all burned up, and they have to go to another fuel. <laughs> but um, they've got these huge masses that press these things together and heat them up, and, they, and in doing so, they run around like crazy, and occasionally knock into each other at just the right speed and angle, and stick together, and then produce you know more, more heat and so forth. That's the idea, and so trying to make fusion energy work is like putting the sun in a bottle, as we used to say. And it started out in 19... I started working at this place in 1956. It had not been there more than about five or six uh, years. And uh, had a very outstanding astrophysicist who knew about this reaction in stars, um, who had the idea for trying to do this. And uh, he was a very, very remarkable man. One of, he now has an inter um, a solar system um, uh, vehicle that's out uh, measuring infrared, named after him. So he was he was well known. And uh, that was I was just had a bachelor's degree, and in physics you don't do much with about kind of doing lab work, sort of half technician, half lab <laughs> lab worker. Interesting, interesting work. Um, too much information on that will slow us down. But I worked a couple of years, and this was um, in, uh, in, a, in a research park in a, in a rural area right just outside of Princeton, New Jersey, and it was administered by Princeton, which was an all-male college. And speaking of all-male, that was also the makeup of most of my physics, math, and chemistry classes. And one of my questions about going into physics is that I had some, I never met a physicist, but I sort of knew they were mostly men. And I thought, am I going to, what am I going to do with this? Here I'm this girl from the South, raised in the 40s, and you know, have people asking my mother why they're sending me to college, and I'm just going to have babies, and you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, so, but it turned out that, um, you know, we were good buddies. It, it worked out. I, I never had... I don't say never, but almost never had any an obvious or even detectable amount of negative um, um, attitudes or behavior toward me. I just and this was long before the feminist movement and so forth. Maybe that was because of why it happened. I don't know. But they were the physicists were fairly enlightened people, and I think they wanted to encourage women to go into that field. So, um, but uh, it was obviously if I was going to do anything in the field, I needed a, a, a more advanced degrees. So I went back to college and I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Interesting place. I walked across. I was hanging up my clothes one day because I didn't have a dryer with a uh, washing machine that I was using. And it's interesting, you put them on the line and you clip them there and they freeze before you can get the clothes pins on them. And they just evaporate. And when, it, when ice evaporates, it's called subliming, which I, I like words too.
So that, and that was, I worked uh, there in, um, well, I was a teaching assistant the first year, and I really enjoyed that. But also then I got to be a research assistant and people doing some nuclear physics where they, were, they had a kind of a low energy atom smasher and uh, analyzing data on um, mechanical calculators because uh, there were no computers in those days. <laughs> Although they did have something automated, they had a, a detector that was putting out data as they ran this machine and it spoke to a typewriter, which was typewriting these little rows and rows of numbers which then had to be calculated. And um, I just was recalling that many, that all of the three places I worked in the physics research environment, um, we had machines, I just love these big machines. And uh, the tip, it was typical of all three of them, you run this machine till it breaks down. And then you go home and you rest and you analyze the data and you fix the machine and you start up again. <laughs> So I mean, we bring in sleeping bags sometimes. Um, that was fun. Um, and so I, I graduated from there, and that was um, um, the beginning of the space era. The Russians had lost, launched a little satellite. I think it was practically just a reflecting ball, but it was the first thing that ever or orbited the Earth that was sent up by humans. And um, uh, got to, I think it made it had a little radio beep, beep, and it went beep, beep, and I, I remember hearing that. And you could actually see it. Uh, maybe you've seen satellites, but you know, sometimes you can see them and re, when they rise up over the horizon and the sun is shining on them from below. But um, that was very exciting because, you know, that, and, and science was really taking off. And it made it easy for me to get jobs because Far fewer people were attending universities and colleges in those days and, and taking science and so forth. And here we were trying to build up a space program. We were getting into the Cold War with the Russians and we had weaponry and all kinds of other stuff to do. And um, it, was, it was a really exciting time to be there and it was easy to find jobs. So, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, the. There's so many good luck, bad luck stories, or bad luck, good luck, whatever it may be. I was born in the middle of the Depression. My childhood was spent in the terrible years of the Second World War. And yet, in, a, in the sense of getting a job, as an example, the way history p played out, uh, I was in the right place at the right time. It was not the struggle that it is today for people in that position. But uh, anyway, the aerospace industry was starting to build up. We were getting ready um, after, I, you know, Sputnik had been launched in about three or four years had passed. And uh, in, in Southern California was where um, a lot of this work was being done, especially on the Apollo project, also on intercontinental ballistic missiles and stuff like that. And I got a job in um, a company called Rocket Valley. <coughs> which made rocket engines, most of the rocket engines, and there were several different kinds on the, in the Apollo project, were made by Rocketdyne in Southern California and tested there. And there was a test study, a site on some hills outside, I mean, within sight of where I lived, actually. And I got hired to help do research on these engines. Um, we got research contracts from different agencies, um, and we're doing, uh, any of you take physics? Yeah, yeah. Physics. okay, so you know, electromagnetic radiation of various sorts, yeah. microwaves, yeah. ultraviolet, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, infrared, we were doing all kinds of measurements on, on these engines as they fired, and um, the, I don't know if you've ever listened to a liftoff of uh, the space shuttle on television. It is, you get a, no, a just tiny notion of the sound of one of those things firing. <laughs> and I'll never forget the first time I went with a technician. It was sort of in, well, after supper time, but it was still light. And the technician and I went up to this bunker. And the reason there's a bunker, because there are Fuel, liquid fuel and liquid oxidizer. And if there's an explosion and they get together, you want to be in a safe place. Yeah. 
And so we were looking through this thick window with this observing device and, and so forth. And the thing ignited, and I went like this. Oh, you know. <laughs> she should have covered my ears. And this, this guy, this fatherly figure, who was saying, pulled my hands away from my eyes. He said, you look at this. Nobody gets to see this. You should see this. <laughs> and it, really, it, I, after that, I always looked, because it was the most powerful thing I have ever seen up close, and scary, and beautiful, and you know, and loud, and it's damaged my hearing, because nobody wore hearing protection either. So that was kind of interesting. And also, um, I got to do lab work, in, you know, there were thousands of people working on this project, and I got to do some lab work and investigation, some of the, trying to fix some of the problems with these engines that we had solved in our company. And, but you had to do certain kinds of measurements to come up with the solution. And so I, um, I was doing these measurements, and one of them was on the engine that lifted the astronauts off the moon. There was an en engine that did the braking, and they really landed, the descent engine, and we went we had the ascent engine, which was sort of on top of the other one. And it had been having problems with another manufacturer, and we had kind of short notice to try to produce one that did work and didn't have problems. And um, so I did some measurements, and they used them and designed the little fix that we needed for it. And you can better believe I was listening live when the astronauts lifted off the moon <laughs> with that engine. So it was nice. It was just a little tiny gadget. Didn't, didn't even have any moving parts. But, um, you know, to be a part of that was, you know, a huge part of my life. And, but, the Apollo project just ended. That was it. Certain number of flights, done. Thousands of people were without a job. So I had, a, what am I going to do? Well, I had been, a part of my research contracts required researching information and finding out, you know, what we could that would be helpful in our work and to make sure we weren't repeating what others were doing. Uh, it's called the not invented here uh, syndrome. You, you know, well, they did it, but we got to do it here too. So, but in any case, uh, the government didn't want to waste its money, so they, they had this. And I enjoyed doing that. I got it because I was probably the only person with a master's degree among the professionals. I was a woman, and I was last hired, so nobody wanted to do that work. Mm -hmm. But I got to sort of the. There was no. Well, they were sort of computers. They were punch cards that I could order or search on <laughs> from another agency. But I, um, I got to look through these printed uh, indexes, subject indexes, and look up these, not only the, a, a, a listing of an article, but a description of it, and sort of get a picture of all kinds of different things that were going on, and learning, okay, learning new stuff, a little bit about a lot of things. And it turned out that that was what I was really suited for. Um, and where can you earn a living not being a specialist? Uh, and it turns out, it, one day I got this brilliant idea. Oh, and because we had a library in our a big company that helped supply us with these materials and stuff like that. And there were some people that had been trained as librarians and I thought, I can do that. And so I went to library school. And I went to it at night. It actually took me five years to get a master's degree in library science. But um, I went to USC, you know, University of Southern California. And the day I got laid off, and I knew it was coming, um, somebody told me that Lockheed, the aircraft manufacturer, which was also in near in nearby, not, not too far away, uh, was looking for somebody to do what they call literature searching for their engineers and scientists. And there are not too many people who know, have a technical background and also uh, are a librarian and information science background. So, you know, uh, and there are not many jobs either, but when it's sort of, it's called a niche career, you know, and I just happened to fit, and they just hired me like that and said, we'll give you any kind, of, I hadn't finished my degree, that's what we give you any kind of flexible hours you need, and so you can finish that, that degree, and then eventually 
I got a job at California State University, Northridge, which is a California State University system. It's got 20 or more uh, universities now. Um, and it's different from the University of California system, sort of like here. And, um, but it's a huge place. It's in the San Fernando Valley. And it's, um, you know, you know 26,000 students. And, you know, it's a fairly good sized place. And they had a lot of resources. And I got to learn, I got to go take courses and other subjects. I really made a beeline for biology because I'd never uh, studied that. But meanwhile, my, and that was basically, I worked there 24 years. So that was, that was that part of my life. Education and job interests. A very, very, um, I just gave a talk to the Kiwanis Club here uh, about my life and I had to give it a title and I said, uh, learn and live because that's my theme, uh, is learning. I'm always trying to learn. And it's not just that, um, you know, I, I, it's just something I, I just am compelled to do. I was like eating. <laughs> um, and um, I'm still taking courses uh, of one sort or another and reading and, uh, and whatever. But um, so that, of course, is one thing I'm doing. I'm sort of a professional student. Another thing is that, and it's related, all of these, uh, well, two of these, my three major hobbies are related to learning, one of which is travel. I have traveled internationally. My husband says, oh, about a hundred countries we've been to. I, I, every time I try to count them, I think, what is a country? There's a whole continent that doesn't have any countries on it. And I've been there. Is that a country? Well, not exactly. Uh, there's an island that is way, way far away from anything in the Pacific. Uh, and, you know, is that a country? No, it's a position uh, or it's part of a state. Um, you know, and, and so forth. So to me, it was novelty and variety. That's what I was after. I wanted to see how people live, what it looks like, uh, just any sorts of things that I could pick up on. And, and it just, you know, very, an interesting thing to do. And I, w I started out with that when the first time I had any money at all, the first job I had it was, a, by the way, the, my first job was at a place that had a code name because it had initially been classified secret because uh, it was like the hydrogen bomb, right? Only except it really wasn't. So they decided not, we're not going to classify it anymore. But, it was given the name Project Matterhorn because this scientist who founded it got the idea as he was coming down from the Matterhorn in Switzerland, this big iconic mountain that you see on posters and so forth. And so um, anyway, um, I got to see that uh, in my first big trip to Europe. Uh, with just uh, the first summer when I was in grad school, uh, I got sort of a, an opportunity to travel on a shoestring to, to Europe and camp a bit and so forth and uh, got to see the Matterhorn. That was a big deal for me. And I just loved the mountains. I really loved them. And I'd gotten a chance to climb one in this Colorado on my first big trip, which is around the country, where I got to see Mount Rainier for the first time and fell in love with the Northwest. You know, 50 years later, I finally got here. But um, anyway, um, I climbed a Colorado peak, and it was extremely hard because I was totally out of condition. It was 14,000 foot peak. But getting on top was, you know, a rush. It really, really was. It was just terrific. You see forever, and you're up on top of the world. Um, and so when I was working at Rocketdyne, they had a recreational department that was, um, are, you, are you ready to quit? Because uh, that was, that was um, uh, had different interest groups, one of which was some mountaineers, and they were looking for new members, and I was totally out of shape, but I, after about two years, I you know, was, became a fairly decent climber, and I loved it. And um, that's how I met my husband. Uh, and he was another mountaineer, and he had, and I was in my mid-30s by that point, 
and had been quite sedentary. I was a daughter of a star athlete, I mean really star. Um, he was a football player, um, was voted by some entity as the outstanding player in his football conference, which was a Southwest conference and no longer exists. But I didn't inherit any of that. But I did find that I could keep going and going and going like an energizer bunny and I could carry heavy loads and um, my feet always hurt me but it, I just kind of ignored them and put patches on them and, and so forth. And, um, and knees too coming downhill but I thought that just goes with the territory so I did that for quite a while. and. My husband thinks we climbed about a thousand peaks, but that includes things you drive up even. <laughs> so, but we did on our honeymoon, we climbed a peak in the Andes called uh, Chimborazo, which is 20,600 feet. Um, and uh, I discovered that one of my talents, which is at no credit to me, is just a something, one of those inherited things. Do you need a problem? Okay. And that is an, an extremely good tolerance of high altitude, uh, thin air stuff. I did. I was with four guys, and one of them was pretty good. But I had the least. I was the least bothered by the altitude of any of those people, and they they could run circles around me at lower altitudes because I was never fast. Uh, and uh, but I did well and. I could eat sardines at 17,000 feet and it didn't bother me, just about drove them out of the tent. But um, in any case, um, in later years I've kind of, repl oh, and I did climb the Matterhorn, which yeah. turns out to be a lot easier than it looks. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, and every other person I've met who's climbed it says the same thing. <laughs> so it's, you know, the easy routes, now obviously they're harder routes. Um, but that was terrific, and it was wonderful weather perfectly clear day and um, so you know and my husband and I had got to climb that um, but anyway I continued mountaineering until my feet gave out I had to have surgery and so forth and um, but I developed a taste for the outdoors and I, I didn't know what to do and as part of my other travels I kept running into birds and suddenly becoming aware, I mean, in this, I was in my 30s or 40s before I knew this, that there are a lot more bird species in this world than are in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, we have, as you go toward the poles, the diversity of species diminishes uh, as you go northward uh, and get into colder climates and around the, you know, the, the equator is where they're, especially in South America, it's where they're most numerous. And um, they just so happened about that time, as I was sort of kind of getting interested, and I had seen, even on our honeymoon, we had climbed this peak, and then uh, the rest of our companions went home, and we decided, we're in South America, let's go see something. And we went down to the Amazon. Um, there's a, a town that's halfway up the Amazon River, uh, accessible only by air or water, and um, but it's a major town, and we visited that and got to sort of go out into the jungle, and. In doing so, we were in with a little tour group of bird watchers. And I'd never seen a bird watcher. I'd seen birds, but no bird watchers. Of really, you know, gung ho, uh, you know, there's a whole spectrum of, you know, de devotion to that, scorekeeping and, you know, collecting and on and on. It's like collecting peaks. Anyway, um, I saw these people and it looked to me like they had a sixth sense. They could see these things that I couldn't see. Where are you looking? You know, where is this thing? They could describe it and they could just and I thought, well that would be interesting, but I just don't have the sixth sense that these people have. You know, I couldn't possibly do that. Okay, couldn't possibly do that. Well, I sort of got interested and they gave a, a an ornithology course or a bird bird course in our local uh, natural history museum. And the man who um, uh, ran the course was a local, was sort of the local authority on, on birds and bird watching. And it was, I was just off and running. I thought, I mean, we had a little field trips and I thought, well, I can't see all the hidden birds there are, but I can see some of them. 
And I learned that birds that I'd been looking at for years, I had never really kind of realized they're another species. And <laughs> I was just starting from zero. But I really, really got into it. And so that was my last big hobby. Five minutes. Okay, five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I combined that with travel. And I ended up seeing um, over half of the species of birds that were listed at the time. Uh, ended up about three years ago with a, seeing about 5,000 species of birds. Um, and all of the families in this particular listing, there are 200 families which are groupings like the doves and the geese and, and ducks and the hummingbirds and you know, different, different families, crows or another family. And I've seen all of the families, and um, got me to places like Bhutan and uh, the jungle in Mindanao, and you know, on and on. <laughs> and so it combined travel and more learning. And while I was at Cal State Northridge, I got to take an ornithology course, which gave me. Uh, I, I met, very few birders do that; they're mostly end up looking at them. And my my main thing was just what they. If you've heard the word hedonism, it means enjoyment, pleasure, as a as a you know as a motivation. That was just you know a real kick when you see one of these gorgeous birds doing some, some really bizarre behavior. It's just you know <laughs> nobody else has ever seen it. If you've ever seen if you've seen the latest issue of National Geographic, there's a big article with fold outs. Some one of you probably have seen that that book. It's in. Do, do you have access to a National Geographic? Well, I think it's for December. If you're, if you know who, somebody who has it, or you're in your school library or wherever, try to find it. It's, it's not on the cover, but it has a fold out of the Birds of Paradise, which are mostly in New Guinea, which is a bizarre place to go to in the first place. Um, and um, they are some of the most unusual creatures, of, you know, in the animal kingdom and also truly gorgeous. So it's just one of those things. I, they listed uh, 39 of them and I've seen 28. I mean, no, sorry, 23. So, <laughs> and anyhow, that's, that's basically what I've been doing. What was your uh, favorite place to visit? My favorite place to visit? Ah. Oh. Okay, that's, almost, that's virtually impossible to answer. Uh, the place that I keep going back to and kind of think I would like to is the British, uh, the British Isles. Yeah. Um, my family is from there and from many generations ago, but I just feel a real affinity for them. And uh, so it's not very spectacular, but it's it's a place where there's always things that I'm interested in seeing. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you, you were very, you did very well. But, um, <laughs> didn't, didn't give you much practice. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you're excellent. Um, but before we wrap this up, I want to ask one more question. I know it's a bit loaded, but uh, do you think you've <laughs> led a good life? Yes, I do. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think that's something.